Okay, great. First, I want to thank all of you for joining in this evening. I know it's Friday evening. Minds are burnt out from work. Everything that has been going on in the world lately, elections are coming up, and there is a lot going on in the world and a lot of distractions right now. I am really thrilled that we have the opportunity to meet Jerry and that he can meet you all and hear some of your experiences as residents of this community. And Brian and Julia also who work closely with Jerry to organize this event. I want to make to make sure that your voices can be heard over to Jerry and he is going to share um, with his team and the city council after this as well. And so I am thrilled to have you all here tonight and have the opportunity to sit with Jerry. And thank you, Jerry, for making this stop on your, your tour for campaigning with us. And I will hand over the floor to Jerry. He has about a 15 minute presentation he would like to, to address. And then also if you have some questions or would like clarification in the middle, go ahead and interject those questions. If you would like to raise a comment, please let Sam know that, um, that you would like to make a comment, wait to be called on and, and called on and give a little bit of time so the interpreter has time to recognize and to be able to voice everybody. We don't want too many people talking over each other. So well, let's wait for everybody to be spotlighted before making a comment. Um, and I'm thrilled and honored to invite Jerry to join us this evening. Thank you very much. Let's give him a round of applause. And over to you, Jerry. I'd like to uh, thank everyone for being here tonight. Um, uh, it's really special for me to be able to speak uh, to this community. Um, as I, I partially lived in this community 40 years ago with my roommate, Carl, who was deaf. And it's, um, as we were discussing prior to the beginning of the meeting, um, it's amazing how much I've forgotten. Interesting. Uh, okay. And, and, uh, uh, and I used to know the alphabet pretty good, a little bit of ASL, and it's just four decades later, it's just not, it's kind of like my Spanish from high school. It's just not there anymore. Um, but it's important that um, I'm able to talk to you and you're able to hear me. It's also important for me to listen to you. And so that's a bigger part of this meeting tonight. Um, I'm not sure that uh, it'll be 15 minutes of discussion by me because I'm more interested in your questions and answering them. Uh, but I've lived here in Pleasanton for 30 years and I've been a, either involved in a community or civically for the past 30 years, uh, 25 of it, either appointed on a commission or a task force um, on the park and rec, on the planning commission in the last eight years as uh, your council member and a uh, couple of years as your vice mayor. Um, I'm, I've been, uh, I moved here because I think the same reason most people moved to Pleasanton. Uh, first of all, it's just a beautiful community, but. Uh, public schools and public safety uh, were the same reasons that, that most of the people I know came here. That's why we came here. Um, when we moved here, my wife was seven months pregnant. We moved it in our house. Her air conditioner was broke. And uh, two months later, our daughter was born and we raised her here. She went to public schools here. Um, she was uh, fortunate through the public schools to be good enough to go to Cal Berkeley and get a degree and move on in life. And I hope through the efforts that I've done the last 25 years and hopefully the next few years, uh, to be able to create an environment where she can afford to come back to Pleasanton. Uh, I think a lot of our children grow and they leave and uh, it's really important that maybe someday they can come back. Um, the city has lots and lots of uh, challenges ahead. Uh, I've had a, probably a hand in anything and everything that's been done in this city the past 25 years, whether it's building, design, growth, no growth. Um, I'm endorsed um, by both sides of of political alignment um, uh, from Swalwell to Baker and uh, two of our county uh, supervisors. We have a, a screen coming up here and I'll wait a second, let everybody see it. Um, and I'm, I'm endorsed by the, uh, the Police Association, the Chamber of Commerce, the Pleasanton Weekly. Um, the, the key is, is that I have about 250 key endorsements um, that are people who recognize the good work I put in and the good work I plan to put in. Uh, and so 
a lot of people ask, well, are you Republican or Democrat or whatnot? And what I am is I'm running for a nonpartisan role as mayor of Pleasanton. It doesn't matter what party you're from. It matters who you represent. And as a council member for the past eight years, or even in any of my commissions or committees, I've always represented everyone in Pleasanton, and I'll continue to do that. Um, but it is good that I'm able to uh, reach outside of the cocoon of Pleasanton. Uh, and I say that because if we just work within our own city limits, um, we're going to miss a lot of things that are happening in our state and our government um, that affect us. And I have been incredibly active uh, with our state legislature. I've been incredibly active with our county, with different agencies in our county. Um, I am the president of the East Bay Division of the League of California Cities. I sit on policy committees up in Sacramento. I, I do a little bit more than most of the council in this, in this city. Uh, because I've learned that we can make decisions in our city that affect us, and we do every day, um, but we have legislatures and we have a governor who have other ideas, and, and, uh, and if we're not in front of them, then we are going to have new legislation that's going to change what we do here, and that's a constant battle. Um, the issues that we have in Pleasanton that we've been dealing with for years and that we will continue to deal with um, everybody knows. But the first and foremost, the thing we have today is we have COVID and how we're dealing with COVID, how you're dealing with COVID um, is uh, it's been very difficult. 2020 has been a very difficult year. Um, it's how we have dealt with it. And I can tell you, I believe our city has dealt with it as fairly as possible. Uh, we created a business support program uh, when we first created it four months ago, five months ago. Um, we had it set up for 1,100 businesses in the city to be able to take loans of up to 2,500 or 2,900 if they were downtown businesses. Um, and that was pretty low, but we also had 1,100 businesses and we had $3 million that we pulled out of the general fund to support them. So we couldn't make the number higher until we knew who would use it. When it came back to us, it turns out of the $3 million that we had literally only earmarked $180,000. We'd only paid out $110,000. So we knew the numbers weren't, weren't high enough. And the staff came back and said, let's move it to 5,000 or 5,800. 5, and when I looked at that, I asked the staff, is it the, is it the loan amount? Is it the years to pay back? Is, is, where, where's, the, where's the gap here that we're missing? And uh, staff was concerned about giving them more money and they couldn't pay it back. So I recommended to council and council took my, my motion and we quadrupled the amount. So now small businesses in the town can get between $10,000 and $20,000 on a three-year loan. Um, and I think that it has helped a lot of businesses. And we're going to have that come back to council again and see where we are. And if we have to raise that, we will, because we, we need to do what we need to do as a city to support business. Just so you know, 60% of our general fund in the city comes from business, whether it's from business taxes or property taxes from business, but 60% of how we operate the city, how we keep the city the way it is comes from business. So it isn't just having wonderful restaurants and merchants downtown. It's, it's, in, it's important to the actual livability of our city. Um, so we know that and we're working towards that. Uh, we also, during COVID, um, created a, a rental uh, gap program to loan money um, to those who rent and can't pay their rent. And we had set aside a half million dollars for that. Uh, when we did that, again, we knew we had a lot of renters in town. And so we have, a, we have this coming back Tuesday night, next Tuesday night. And I believe we're going to expand that program because, again, we think we, we need to put more, either more money into it or make more money available um, uh, as far as what kind of loans or grants can be given for the rental program. And then last but not least on COVID, we've also met all of our nonprofit grants that we get every year and we call block grants. Uh, we've met all of our nonprofit grants. We actually took another almost $400,000 and put that into our block grants this year to meet Meals on Wheels and, and other organizations, Open Heart Kitchen and other organizations, because we knew uh, they would be affected by COVID as well as their clients. Um, so those on, on those ends, money and how we've managed to support people in COVID 
And then the other thing is, is the downtown. And I'm sure everybody here uses our downtown. It's the heartbeat of our city. Um, and while I have been advocating for 20 years to create the mall effect of shutting down the downtown and let diners eat out on the street with the restaurants, it was always a pushback that we need parking. We, people need to drive to their restaurants. And we've seen over the last 13, 14 weeks that it does work. And, um, and we, we've, expand, we've extended it twice. Uh, we've now extended it to November 1st. So please come out on the weekends. It's uh, the, the, the downtown is shut down right now. Yay. We'll be, uh, <laughs> Someone said, <okay>. yay. <laughs> okay. And uh, good. And, um, uh, and it, it goes to November 1st. So, um, but I will tell you that uh, we also... Uh, we had to fund the ability to shut the downtown down and, and do this for the restaurants and emergents. Um, we've earmarked money to pay for that, but we've also earmarked money for next year. Now, we're not making decisions for the next council. We're not making decisions for the PDA, the Pleasanton Downtown Association. But I believe this city has gotten used to having downtown like it is on the weekends and wants it to continue. So it's a matter of working it out with the merchants and the restaurants and the PDA and making sure this is the program is working so that everybody is served. Um, but we're going to bring it back next year. And, and I, I wouldn't, if, if I'm not elected, if I'm not the mayor, uh, whoever is the mayor, whoever is on council had, had better uh, have a good reason why we wouldn't continue uh, doing this downtown because it's become really wonderful for our city. Um, and so we are also paying attention to the merchants that once this ends and, and whether they can get dining inside, which is soon, that there's some who aren't going to be able to bridge the gap. And we're going to lose some of our merchants to some of our restaurants. We know that. Uh, we're going to do everything we can to keep them here. But, um, but, but it is, you know, in the, they are individual businesses and, and, and the city isn't in the business of keeping people afloat. So uh, what we hope is that if there's opportunity loss on, on one end, that there's opportunity gained on another and somebody else will open a restaurant. Um, I know that sounds tough, but it's a reality. And, and I think the city has done everything they can. Uh, we will continue to, uh, but that's the business side of things. And that's COVID. Um, our numbers are good in Pleasanton. Our numbers are good in, in West in East County. Um, however, we're still connected as one county and uh, we're slowly, we're now in what they call the orange category. Um, and hopefully our numbers in California will continue on the track that they are. Unfortunately, in the rest of the country and the rest of the world, the numbers are going the wrong direction again. They're calling it a third, a third phase of this, this COVID. Uh, but so far, what we're doing here is working and, and hopefully we'll continue. Um, we wear our masks, we wash our hands, we stay our six feet, um, we do the things we've all learned to do. I think we're all going to come out of this okay. But there are other things in the city that we have to pay attention to. While we're all trying to get out of 2020, we have to pay attention to 2021, which is just around the corner. Um, and, and we have things in the city that we need to do and this next council will need to do. And one of the first things is, is that we will be doing a new housing element for our general plan. Our general plan is basically uh, our good book that runs the city. And it tells us what we're supposed to do as, as um, stewards of the city. And every seven years we have to do, well, actually every year we have to update our housing element and provide it to the state to be certified. But every seven years, we have to update this housing element and we have to um, assimilate the new housing zoning numbers that are given to us by the state. And, and uh, the numbers this time are over double what we had five and a half years ago. And uh, so we have a year and a half to figure out how to rezone sites throughout Pleasanton and, and figure out where we're gonna put 4,800 new uh, sites in Pleasanton, uh, units in Pleasanton. Um, that's a mix of above moderate homes, moderate homes, low and very low housing. Um, and I am of the opinion that um, the metrics used um, are not fair to not only Alameda County, but Contra Costa County and have given Santa Clara County a break. Um, we actually have more housing given to us than the companies that have most of the employees and uh, in Santa Clara County. And 
and there's a movement afoot. We had some we had some great stuff happen yesterday, and then we got denied um, to make a change in the way these allocations come. But I guarantee you, we'll con continue to do the fight. Um, and uh, uh, but we need to next year. We need to do this housing element that will take us nearly two years to put together, and we have to have it ready by January of 23. Um, and when we look at siting throughout the city, we have to look at where we can put high density multifamily home housing on top of single family homes. Uh, and so part of that includes the east side. And I don't know how many of you heard about developing or not developing the east side. But in order to handle these numbers this time, we need to do a specific plan on the east side and roll that into how we plan the city over the next two years. If we don't do that, we don't do that in parallel with our housing element, we will not be able to use the east side to certify our housing element in two years. And if we don't do that, then we will put 4,800 units mostly in North Pleasanton uh, because that's where we have land. We either in the, the mall area or in the Hacienda Business Park area. Um, and that has many impacts. Uh, first of all, I don't believe everybody who lives in North Pleasanton wants all those units in their backyard. Um, second, uh, the most impacted elementary schools we have in this city are in the north end of town, Leidigson, Donlin, Fairlands. Um, so there's a, there's a balance and a mix that we need to take care of. Um, but we've had some major changes that the agencies in California are not uh, taken into a, a account. And that is right now during COVID, our, our employment has, has changed. Um, in, in the city of Pleasanton, we have 63,000 jobs. We're known as a jobs rich, housing poor community because we have an imbalance between jobs and houses. Um, when you look at that 63,000 jobs, 80% of those jobs are filled by people who don't live in Pleasanton. And when you look at the number of people who live in Pleasanton that are employed, 80% of those people leave town to go to work. So on a normal non-COVID day, work day, you have this crossover twice a day of people going out and people coming in. And then you have the pass through coming over the Altamont of uh, an additional 27,000 cars a day in just the last five years over the Altamont. And so now in COVID, a lot of those jobs are staying remote. They're, they're at home or wherever the remote might be. It's not even typically here. Um, and the question is, what is going to change going forward? Are we gonna return where people go back to work five days a week and on both sides, the people coming into town and people going out of town? I doubt it. I really doubt it. I think we've had a big, huge change in the way people work. And I think especially until we have a full vaccine and COVID is behind us, um, this will be the norm. But if we're planning for a seven year cycle, housing cycle, uh, and we're not taking any of this into, into uh, account, I think we're making a mistake. And I think the state's making that mistake. So the next council, the next mayor and city council will have to deal with this. And I'm prepared to deal with this. I've dealt with this on the state level of the state legislature, in the policy committees of the League of California Cities, and then regionally in the various uh, uh, joint powers authorities that I sit on throughout the county. Uh, I sit on 13 different committees and boards and agencies in Alameda County as a council member for the city of Pleasanton. And, and so moving forward, it's going to take knowledge and experience and especially leadership to guide this council and guide city staff working with our city manager and his executive team to take the city where it needs to go during this period. So that that's the growth part of what we face in the next couple of years. We have a lot of traffic um, issues that have been overnight solved because of COVID, but they will come back. And, uh, and I sit on the LAFTA board, which is the wheels bus uh, agency. Uh, it's the number one transit agency in the country right now, and it's been number one in California for the last two years. Um, and that's because three years ago, we did a comprehensive um, operational analysis of the agency, something that government should do in a lot of places, and, um, and changed the way the agency works. We eliminated routes uh, where they were not efficient, um, and we, in, we brought in a new program um, uh, bringing in the, the TNCs, the, the uh, 
um, the transit networking companies, which are Lyft and Uber and even taxi companies, uh, and subsidizing rides in areas where we don't provide bus service. And that has actually worked really well. So we expanded that from Dublin to the Tri-Valley, and that now is occurring in the Tri-Valley. So if you don't know it, you can actually take an Uber or a Lyft or a taxi to BART if you're, or to ACE, and you can actually get subsidized by LAFT or by wheels. Um, and another great opportunity that we have that we're doing is we have a, what's called an SAV. It's a shared autonomous vehicle. It's like a small minibus, carries 15 to 20 passengers, no driver. And it's actually functioning right now, driving between BART and the jail and back and forth and it's learning how to drive in Dublin and, and with lights and whatnot, stoplights. Um, we think we'll have that functional and ready to go in Dublin within a year and be able to take passengers. That's what we call last mile solution and it's revolutionary. Uh, and there are around the country, these SAVs are beginning to pop up and, and not in service yet because there's a lot of uh, artificial intelligence work that's being done. Uh, but I see it as a real solution to where you may not need your car to get to BART or ACE or even to a bus stop. Uh, you might be able to jump on an on a SAV someday in the near future. So uh, we have um, also we have the Valley Link Rail Authority, um, and that's because BART won't go to Livermore. And just so you know, BART will never go to Livermore. That is over with. Um, I feel sorry for people in Livermore who have been promised for 60 years that BART would come to them, um, but BART is not going to do that. And, um, and we just had a, a real win because we created the authority with San Joaquin County and Alameda County uh, to build a rail service, connect to BART in Pleasanton, uh, that will eventually take you all the way to Stockton. Um, that should give some relief to 580. That won't happen for another six to seven, eight years but that's the planning that we're doing today. And there was, there was $400 million that was sitting in, in a bond measure for Alameda County that was supposed to go to BART to help build this extension to Livermore. And we had a real battle royale um, throughout the county because there were people in other cities who didn't think this rail service to live out of Livermore and Pleasanton was important, but they wanted the $400 million to go to BART anyways. And we actually had a vote with the uh, Alameda County Transit, uh, Transportation Commission. We needed 18 votes. A lot of us called in, spoke, sent letters, including myself. And we got exactly 18 votes. And that $400 million is now going to the, the Valley um, uh, Rail Authority so that we can build this new rail service into the Valley from San Joaquin. Um, and again, you always have to work towards the future. Um, you can't necessarily just sit with Pat today and hope something happens. So that's what we're doing on transit. You also have the, um, the toll lanes coming on north, uh, northbound on, on 680. We're widening Highway 84. Um, and then hope against hope that BART will turn into a better agency and provide clean and safe trains for people in, in Pleasanton. Um, to, uh, to take. Um, I have been working with Deborah Allen, who's uh, um, from District 1 of BART. She's a BART, BART board member, and I think she's doing great work with BART. She needs a lot of support. Um, but that's our transit side. Um, hey, Gary, if, I know we've got some questions because um, we want to have some discussion. So I want to okay. manage the time because we've been going for about a half hour. And I know okay. Sam, Sam has received some questions. So do you want to just kind of hit some of the any key points you want to before we go into questions? You want to throw my slide up and just mention a couple things. Sure. You get me going, I don't stop. So, you know, it, um, so I have a great relationship with uh, our superintendent, Dave Haglin, with P, the Pleasanton Unified School District, and, and Steve Maher, our school board president. Um, I, our city needs to work with our school district to continue to provide the incredible quality education that they do. Um, but the schools have a lot of hard work in front of them. Uh, a lot of the money that used to be there for them isn't there. And so the city needs to step up where it can. Uh, we've done a great job on pension reform in this city. And anybody who has a question about that, I'd be happy to answer. 
public safety, um, we're not going to defund our police department. I'll just leave it right there. Uh, but we will, we will have a, um, a mental health uh, crisis team pilot program sometime in the near future. Uh, cultural inclusiveness is something that's really important because our city has changed. Our city has changed in the 30 years that I've lived here and we're very diverse now. We need more of that in, in city leadership, in uh, committees, uh, task forces, um, and we need to understand what everybody's culture is and, and, uh, and embrace each other. And I think City of Pleasanton's done that. Uh, on complete streets, I'm the bicycle guy in Pleasanton. I ride my bike everywhere. I just did a 64 mile ride throughout the entire city of Pleasanton last Sunday. Um, went into every single neighborhood in Pleasanton um, to show that uh, I do represent the entire city. Uh, but I've been a real advocate for the green lanes that you see and the, the protected bike lanes and better pedestrian elements. Um, and then when it comes to growth, uh, I'm a real open space guy. I spend two or three days a week, as I did today up on the Pleasanton Ridge, um, where we can keep open space. I want to keep it. We have 44 parks in this city, and I'm very proud of that. Um, again, back to the business that I started with. Business is very important. Uh, attraction and retention. Um, we have a master plan for our library and civic center. I believe what we're going to be able to afford to do is build a new library and hopefully a community center. Uh, clean water is a big issue in the city, uh, taking the, the unregulated contaminants out of our water, but also creating recycled water. Another phase of that is something that I have been uh, on for a long time. And then, as I mentioned, affordable housing, workforce housing is needed. And all that comes down with the housing elements that I mentioned as planned progress. So there you go. Um, those are the key things that I find important, but I know there's more important and I'd love to hear your questions. Sorry, interpreter was on mute. I'm gonna go ahead and we'll start some questions. If anybody has one, raise your hand and we will spotlight to you. All right, uh, one second, let me find, wait, let me find. Hi, is, I'm Joey Bear, and this is the first time that I've had this type of conversation with a mayor candidate. So thank you so much for making this possible. Uh, you talked about COVID-19, and I am really, I appreciate hearing that the numbers are stabilizing. However, I do still have some concerns. We have Halloween coming up. I know as people saying that, oh yeah, we'll go ahead and have trick-or-treating. We'll go ahead with some other of the activities uh, that's coming in a few weeks, and I'm hesitant about that. So I'm curious about your position on this. Yeah, we, um, thank you for your question. Thank you, Joey. Um, there's a there's for me there's a point of what level of government you need when it comes to COVID. I, I believe we're an educated community in Pleasanton, and we are all, all of us are under COVID. Right? We have restrictions, shelter in place. You can't go places. You have to have a test before you can do this or do that if you want to fly. Um, so where I'm really concerned is is how many ordinances the city might um, have to continue to tell you or me what to do and what not to do. And when it comes to, we have a lot of people who have asked, why don't you do a mask ordinance? Why don't you, why don't you tell us that we have to wear a mask, not just educate us and encourage us to wear a mask, but we have people who want us to make it a citable offense. Um, and, and when I look at that, it's, first of all, when I'm downtown these days, I, I see people wearing masks. I see people complying. Uh, when you go into a restaurant or you go to a restaurant, if you go into a store, you have to have a mask on. So it's, it, it's I don't know where we would, we would take it the next level up um, to put an ordinance out that says, okay, now you can be cited and fined if you're not wearing a mask. And I believe the people who aren't wearing masks will continue to not wear a mask and they will challenge the system. We, and, and so, you know, just to enforce something like that, we have one code enforcement officer in Pleasanton. He's plenty busy. We would not have police out citing and finding. It just, it, they're busy enough. So it comes down to educating and, and actually asking people for the human courtesy part. I wear a mask. 
I'm pretty fairly confident about my health, but I wear a mask mostly because I don't want any of you around me to get something I may not know I have. And I'm hoping that people do that. When it comes to trick-or-treating, we, we've we stopped the trick-or-treating, the, uh, the whole Halloween stroll downtown, the merchants won't be handing out candy. Uh, Second Street has decided not to do trick-or-treating this year, which is a big draw in our city. Um, uh, and I know of some homes and people who have said, well, if they knock on my door, I'm going to give them candy. That's a personal choice. That's a personal choice on the parents. It's a personal choice on the individuals. Um, I don't know that what what we would gain if I came out and said, let's ban Halloween. It, it's just another. I just think we got to trust people in the city to do the right thing. Um, and I do believe that uh, from everyone I've talked with, no one's expecting trick or treaters this year. Um, I have actually suggested that downtown if you did it in a safe mode, you did it with merchants where the kids and nobody was putting hands across things and they were using tongs. And then it just, the bigger issue with that is this herd mentality is that, wow, they are going to do trick or treat downtown and we get a thousand kids downtown. Um, and you know, everybody's not going to wear a mask or not going to wear it properly. And so I, I, I fall on the side of less government, smarter people. Okay, we're switching interpreter roles now. So Sam's saying, uh, are there any other questions? I see Jay has a question. Acknowledging you, Jay, go ahead. Hi, my name is Jay Thexton. Uh, I've lived here in Pleasanton for about 16 years, uh, although I've moved uh, a lot around town. Um, uh, but I can't, and I've lived in a lot of different places and have not, not seen anywhere better than here. Uh, is there anything that you have in mind in terms of uh, supporting the deaf community? Uh, you know, there are several deaf people now living here in Pleasanton. Um, do you have anything in mind uh, that, that, that you have as far as initiatives go to support us in the deaf community here? Well, thank you, Jay, for your question. You know, I have to be honest, uh, you know, there's a radar for everything in a city. We, things come up on our radar and we go, well, let's take care of that. Let's do something about that. Um, we don't have enough tennis courts and, and the gate is locked in a certain park and uh, we, need, um, uh, we, need to, we need to close the downtown because restaurants aren't doing business. So the radar keeps bringing in things and you deal with that. And for 25 years, on the various committees and task forces and whatnot, I have to be honest, it just wasn't brought to me that are, are we are we doing this? Are we taking care of the deaf and hard hearing in our city? It just hasn't brought been brought to me. Now I will tell you this experience for me has opened my eyes and my ears again um, that I am questioning how come I haven't had this as, as something we should be doing. And why, why haven't we done this for city functions, for the holiday parade, for the veterans parade? I mean, why haven't we? Now, I do realize that hiring interpreters and whatnot for various events adds to somebody's budget. Um, but if we're inclusive in our city, then we're inclusive of everybody. And so I will promise you this, where I've been remiss in not having this on my radar, that's, that's over with. You are on my radar now. And I will tell you that every two years, the city council has what's called council priority setting. All right. And we have a, we set a two year work plan every two years. And it, we're just ending a two year work plan right now. So the new council, the new mayor, new council members next year, by March, throughout January and February, it will go to the various commissions and committees and whatnot. And eventually they'll be brought to an evening where we will have a public hearing. And, and we as a council will put items on those council priorities that we need to do something about over the next two years. And part of that, those things have different priorities. There's, there's priorities that are do this this year, do this over the two years, or at least do something about it over the next two years. So there's just different levels of, of priorities. There's no reason why we can't put 
include the deaf and hard of hearing community in city business and city activities. There's no reason why we can't address that. Um, sure, if there's budgetary issues, there's budgetary issues. Um, but certainly, I think what it's going to take for me is more, more communication with your community and tell me where you need us to change things. It's, it's not like we're going to have an interpreter for every single thing we do in every single committee, but where, what are the things you want to see change? And if you send me that list and I'm able to sit down with city manager and the city staff and say, how can we address this? And I will tell you how this works is four years ago, I went and I do a lot of bike rides. I went and did a charity bike ride where I rode 200 plus miles to raise $2,500 for an all abilities inclusive park in Santa Cruz. And that park is now open and running. It's just an incredibly wonderful park. When I came back to Pleasanton, I sat down with our city manager and I said, why aren't we doing this here? And it has taken us time. And it is now, we just approved the park and the design of the park and the designer of the park. And it will happen out at the Ken Mercer Sports Park over on Hop Yard. Um, sometimes things take time. I don't understand, I won't understand how we can't include your community quicker than that, but that's an example of one council member bringing something to the city and saying, we need to do this. We need to do something about this. <clears throat> but what level that we do this at is up to you guys. I need to hear from you. And not only do I need to hear from you, but the rest of our council and our mayor needs to hear from you. And especially as we set the council priorities next year. Um, but I, I will promise you this, I will have a conversation with the city manager in the next 24 hours and tell them about this wonderful conversation that we had tonight and how come we're not doing this conversation more often. So there's my answer. Great, great. Now I know that uh, Steve had some questions. Uh, sorry, Stephanie had some questions. Yes, Stephanie's saying yes. Thank you for your time, taking the time to chat with us, uh, us Pleasanton resident, residents. I really do appreciate that. And I have to say, I'm a very proud resident of this community. This community is very inviting. It's very inclusive. It has a real small town feel. And that's just one reason why we love it so much here. And the reason why a lot of us are living here is because the California School for the Deaf, as you may be aware of, I don't know if you are aware of it, but the California State School for the Deaf is in Fremont, right? just across the hill there, right? So not too far from us here. So for many of us, uh, we've chosen to live here rather than in Fremont. Uh, for our own personal reasons, uh, our own, I, we're very biased, you know, we like the small town feel here, as opposed to Fremont. So, so really, we just love it here. And we're very active participants in our community, uh, with the parks with, uh, with the city recreational activities, we're frequently involved in those. And sometimes we do face barriers. Uh, you know, we have to kind of struggle through to get interpreter services provided so that we have access to information and communication. And so those are some of the challenges that we face. But I am happy to say that to date, um, things have been pretty accessible. Uh, accommodations have been provided. Uh, and it's really nice to know that you've made this commitment to really listen to us and uh, that you really value us, us as part of the community in Pleasanton. Now, uh, Foothill High School, Amador Valley High School, uh, both of those schools have American Sign Language classes. Uh, I happen to work at Ohlone College in Fremont. And uh, so I sometimes do visit uh, different school programs, uh, different sign language programs uh, throughout the counties to try and attract some of those students to our interpreter program that we have at Ohlone College. Uh, and so I've met several uh, hearing people who live here in Pleasanton who are really enthusiastic about wanting to be involved with the deaf community, wanting to learn more about us, uh, wanting to really get involved with us. And so um, it just makes me wonder, you know, what would your commitment be to uh, celebrating the fact that we have so many deaf people living here in Pleasanton? Um, for example, uh, 
September is is known as Deaf Awareness Month. So would you be open to maybe having a Deaf Awareness Month activity, something like a, a show, an event, a play, something that would just raise awareness of American Sign Language and Deaf culture um, that exists in our midst here in Pleasanton? Yeah, thank you, Stephanie. Absolutely. Um, I have been to graduations at both Amador, my daughter graduated from Amador, and Foothill High over the years. Um, I either as a council member or be invited as a guest. And one of the highlights of each graduation is the ASL teams come out and they sign a song um, for the, the graduates and the graduates' families. And it's always a highlight. And it's amazing how you brought that up. And it's like, yeah, I remember that, that, that how wonderful that is. Um, and yeah, I have, um, I am, I'm in the creative field. That's what I do for a living and uh, in the film and video world. And, uh, and the Firehouse Art Center is, is uh, something that I, I helped get built and, and, uh, and absolutely having a program in September to celebrate um, uh, the world of uh, the deaf world and the hard of hearing world. Uh, that will take all of you to come to me and come to our council and maybe work with uh, Heidi, our director for library and parks, uh, to figure out what kind of program we could do. Um, Mark Duncanson, who, who leads our, our theater program and whatnot with our youth, uh, there's no reason why we can't put something together that's comprehensive and, and does exactly what you said, celebrate it during the month of September. Um, again, input is always important, like this kind of idea and, and, and what needs you have. Input to me, input to the city. Um, if you go on a city site and you pick the email for the mayor and the city council, it goes to us and it goes to the directors and the city staff. So everybody knows what it is you're asking for and why you're asking for it. And outreach is really important. And it's um, like for me in my bike world, uh, when I first started um, working towards better streets and safer streets and whatnot, is some 20 something years ago. And we had, I think we didn't have a single green lane in the city at the time. Now we have them all over the city. So some of these things are going to change, but it's not going to happen overnight. But with effort and communication and collaboration, these things can happen. And there's no reason why this can't happen. We can, we can use the excuse right now that we've got COVID and we can't do this right now, but we can talk about it and we can plan for it and we can collaborate on it. And I absolutely will do that. I, I, I would be thrilled to be part of a program at the Firehouse Art Center, the Amador Theater, and, and celebrate, um, uh, you know, the Deaf Month in September and having a program that, that's centered around that. Great. That's great. Uh, we have time for maybe one or two or three more comments. We have about 15 minutes. So, uh, Julie Smario. I see you have your hand raised. It's, uh, I'm here with David, my husband. Uh, my name is Julie Rems Mario. We have three adult children here, uh, 26, 24, and 22 that we've raised in Pleasanton. Uh, of course, they don't live here anymore, uh, but but we are, like you said, wanting them to be able to move back here near us someday. We want to be grandparents. Uh, we want to be able to have our grandchildren near us as well. And so, you know, I captured, I caught on to that statement you made about your own children, you know, and wanting them to be able to come back here, your child wanting her to be able to come back and live here in Pleasant. So I wonder what sort of ideas do you have to that end as far as uh, attracting our children to move back here? Yeah, I think, Julie, you know, the, the hardest part is, is there's no inexpensive land in Pleasanton. And when we zone a piece of property and say, this can be high density multifamily, that makes it even more expensive. And then we say we want affordable housing in that project, and that makes it even more difficult to build. Um, but there are methods and ways for us to do this. And the problem with Pleasanton is, and for the older people on this, uh, this call, like myself, I'll be 64 in a few days. When I was growing up, we had what was called step-up housing. You could rent a small apartment, an efficiency apartment, a one bedroom. It, you could buy a small home or a townhouse or a condo. Uh, and eventually as your life changed and your career moved along and you got married, you could buy a house in Pleasanton someday. Um, 
we don't have any step up housing in Pleasanton anymore. The cheapest house in Pleasanton is a trailer in a trailer park for $350,000. Uh, the cheap, cheapest house is a condo that's 40 or 50 years old. It's one bedroom, 800 square feet, and it's $500,000. Um, not exactly step up housing. So when we look at these new numbers coming from the state and we know we'll have to cite the zoning in the city, one of the changes that we can make and I will fight for is when these apartment buildings or these condos or townhouses go up, um, they're, they're required to build between 15 and 20% affordable housing within those units. But over the years, they've also had the opportunity to buy their way out of affordable housing by putting money into what we call our lower income housing fund. And, and in some cases, we've taken that money uh, because uh, it, it was enough for us to do something else with. And I'll give you an example. On the corner of Bernal, Stanley and Valley, there's an apartment complex that got built in the last few years. It's 380 apartments. And when they would have had some, something like 60, 70 affordable apartments in there. And the developer didn't want to do that. And by law, the lower income housing fund would have required that developer to pay about a million and a half dollars. And we wouldn't have accepted that. And the developer knew that. So the developer came to us and paid $4.3 million to not have affordable housing in that project. And for the city, that was a windfall of money to put towards affordable housing. And with that money, we helped build the Cottinger Gardens, which is now 185 senior, very low uh, affordable uh, cottages and apartments over on Cottinger and, 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 um, and Vineyard. And then we also put some of that money towards um, Sunflower Hill. Uh, Sunflower Hill is, for a, is a developmentally disabled community that's opening right now with 33 units in the, uh, in the new development on Stanley called Meritage Homes or the old Irby Ranch. Um, so those are examples of where we use that lower income housing fund money. But moving forward, the only way we're going to get affordable housing, Julie, is that we don't allow them in the multifamily high density housing by their way out. We make them build affordable housing. And I will tell you, I've had developers sit across the table from me and tell me, oh, your fees and the costs, I can't afford to do this. And I always tell them, you're not sitting in front of me if you can't afford to do this. It's just that simple. If you can't afford to do this, you've already left town. So when we move forward with a new zoning and a new siting, if the council stays strong and we do the new housing element and we codify it where we say we will allow lower, lower income housing for single family homes because it's nearly impossible to build an affordable single family home in this town. Um, we're lucky if we could have a single family home built in this town and sell it for less than a million dollars or a million two. Um, those, are the, those are the homes that we would pay into the fund. But multifamily high density, we're going to require the affordable housing. And there's one other place that we can do something. And we did it in the Gateway Homes over on the Bernal Community Park some 20 years ago. And that there's homes and duplexes there that are what we, and 20% of them are what we call deed restricted. That means you can buy the house, but your deed is restricted. And when you sell the house some 5, 10, 20, 30 years later, you're not getting the equity out of it if you had bought a regular house somewhere else in town. But you get to own the house. You get the interest, uh, mortgage interest from it. Um, you get a CPI bump every year for the value of the home. So deed restriction is another way for us to do owned property in the city down the road now, it's a little tough on the city because the city has to manage deed restricted. I don't have a problem with that. If we can create deed restricted housing in this town and we have to have somebody in the planning department handle that, then we'll put somebody in the planning department to handle that. Because that's the only way we're going to get workforce housing, essential worker housing, is if we either do deed restricted or we force on the multifamily high density homes the developer to build affordable housing. I hope that answers some of your question. Yes, thank you. Thank you. And I just want to mention that uh, you have are the, a politician I, that's made the most sense to me in a long time. Uh, I really can't remember the last time I heard somebody make so much sense. 
Well, I, Julia, I like to think of myself as your elected representative and not necessarily a politician. Uh, the politics side of this, this gig is not really my thing. And you can ask Brian, my campaign manager here. I hate the politics side of this. Um, what I've enjoyed in my last 25 years of my civic service that I've done with the city is to be able to represent everybody in Pleasanton to create the city that I love, that I want to live in, and the one that I raised my kid in and I hope she returns to. Um, so, yes, um, that's who I am. Great. Okay. And I, uh, time is uh, soon going to run out. We do have time for one more question uh, for Jerry before we close. So uh, anyone out there have a last question for Jerry? Uh, Sylvia's got her hand up. Yeah. Can I go? Yes. Okay. Hi, I'm Sylvia. Uh, I live here in Pleasanton. I've lived here for about four years and six months, and I just really love it here. I love living here. Uh, I enjoy the kind of services uh, that the community of Pleasanton provides. The city applies. The dog parks are really great. A lot of us deaf people love our dogs, uh, so we really do appreciate having the dog parks. So I just wonder, how can we give back to the community? How can we become involved in on different committees uh, or events uh, in the city of Pleasanton? Um, I know there's sort of neighbor next door things. We can follow what's going on in Pleasanton. Uh, I, there's a lot of things going on, uh, like the Costco thing. Some of us are for it, some of us are not. Uh, but I just wonder where can we have more of a voice in, uh, in the Pleasanton community? Well, I won't speak for the current council or the current mayor, but if I'm elected, I hope to continue to do this sort of thing, is having open uh, forums, Zoom meetings, um, eventually when we can gather again to have meetings with people, coffees, um, to find out what the needs are and, and, and the wants are. And, and there's a big difference between needs and wants, believe me. We have to address needs before wants. Uh, but having your community involved, along with having other communities in the city involved, and coming to us and offering to volunteer is key. We have places for all of you. We do. It's it, people come in and go, I want to be on a planning commission. Well, I've got five really good people on a planning commission and I don't need 50, but there's ways to serve in the city. And if I'm mayor, if you reach out, I will find a way for you to be able to serve. But in your community, I think would be great is if we had volunteers. Now, I don't want to take away paying jobs from interpreters, but if we have special events and things and we can reach out to your community and say, would somebody like to interpret for our, our meeting? Would somebody like to interpret for the celebration that we're doing? That would be wonderful. I, I know there's there's expected levels of interpretation that and I think I'm, I'm, I'm assuming our interpreters here have done a wonderful job tonight. Um, uh, but but that to me, as I go forward, yes. if the city says, oh, you have to have a certified interpreter in order to use one. Well, I'm going to find out if I do or not. And you're going to tell me if I do or not. But um, but I have an open door. And I will be more than happy to listen to all of you, not just because you're deaf or hard of hearing, but because you live here and you want this city to be what we all want it to be, a great city. So I, I will be open to interpretation. I'll be open to communication uh, in the future. And I'll find something for you to be participating in. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Oh, and just you know, one example is uh, in Fremont. Um, they have uh, the chorus interpreters. Concert interpreters. In concert Fremont interpreters. Park. The concert interpreters in Fremont Park. So that's just an example. So that may be something Pleasant can think about providing. Sam's saying, okay, if anybody has one last burning question for Jerry before we close, uh, perhaps you can ask it now. This is just more of an FYI for you, Jerry. Uh, a lot of the people who are at this meeting right now, present tonight, uh, especially Joey, uh, his son has made a film about children of deaf adults. And I would encourage you to, to watch his film if you can, because it really does capture what it's like to grow up and live in this community as a child who uh, grew up in a deaf family in Pleasanton. 
Yeah, it's in, uh, and just in case you don't know, the, the acronym CODA, C-O-D-A, stands for Child of Deaf Adults. So many of us deaf adults here raise children who are not deaf and live in this community, and, and Joey's son in particular made a film. Joey's saying, I'll send you the link so that you can watch yeah, it. It's a, really, it's a really good film. Yeah. Okay, so Sam's saying, all right, well, uh, I think most importantly, uh, before in closing, we want to thank Jerry for his time, his thank his whole campaign team for all the work they've done in organizing this event. So kudos to all of those people first. Uh, secondly, uh, last but not least, very important, let's thank our interpreters uh, who volunteered to interpret for us tonight. Thank you, Dan, and thank you, Lisa. Uh, and then again, um, you see some information now there's a website available there's an email address uh if you want to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with jerry private conversation uh let me know if there's any specific thing you want me to redirect toward him um, i'd be happy to do that you can either contact him directly or through me and just thank you for all for participating tonight thanks a lot uh jerry do you want to make any sort of closing remarks at all i just uh thank you for having me tonight um, uh, it's been, I think it's been better for me than probably than you guys that, that I've had this ability to have this communication tonight, this, this talk, and, uh, <laughs> and I will take this forward. Um, it, it's just brought up, um, so many memories and so many different things. And uh, the one thing, when you mentioned the school in Fremont, uh, I don't, it's so long ago, but I attended a football game, um, and the school had a football team. And I was uh, being a former Marine and having done drill, what we call the silent drill um, and where there's no commands and whatnot. And you just know what you need to do for like 500 different moves. Um, and then watching this football team go out on the field and play another football team that is commanding and barking commands and, and giving calls, but they through their own ability to sign and communicate with each other, they were a great football team. They played a really good game. They didn't win, but but it wasn't the winning or the losing. It was their ability to go out and mm -hmm. participate in the sport that they loved. And I, I remember that, uh, that I just thought it was so cool. So yes, your community is important. Uh, all of our communities are important, but it's, it's important that we're inclusive of everybody. And I think we've dropped the ball a bit with your community and we need to pick it up. Great, great, great. That's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.